That is a, a long introduction to a, a pretty normal thing, which is brothers getting together and talking about stuff. And I think really the genesis of this whole concept is the idea that some of the best things that happen at a conference is the conversations backstage. We had dinner last night. didn't take us long to get stuff rattling around. And uh, I really have gleaned a lot from my conversations through the years with brothers that love the Lord, believe the gospel, stand on the word of God. And uh, so we're going to try to have some of those conversations today. And I want to acknowledge at the outset that some of the positions that we're going to describe or even maybe caricatures of how you feel. But uh, there's, we're certainly uh, on the right uh, target if we're not on the bullseye. And we want you to early on to represent those positions. Let's exchange, let's talk, let's grow, let's learn from each other, and let's model what it means for iron to sharpen iron and brothers to make each other better, all right? And uh, we had a good conversation last night even about brothers and how they kind of argue and go at it, all right? So we're going to do that right now. And uh, hey, are those uh, I like, I don't like signals working? Let's have another little test on that. Like, don't like. How do you think I'm doing so far? Okay, Perry likes it. Driscoll's out on me. Okay, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. As, as my brothers would say, I expected that. And uh, wow. all right, so uh, Stephen, we're going to have you go first. And uh, you've got a heart for lost people. You're passionate about sharing the gospel and, and winning people. Uh, make the case for that's the purpose of the weekend service. We're going to reach people far from God. Let's hear it. Well, in general, before I make the case that that's the purpose of the weekend service, I mean, we're talking in a larger way about what the mission of Jesus was to seek and save that which is lost, Luke 19.10. And then also that Jesus came not for the healthy but for the sick. And so we take something broad like that and then we narrow it down to say what is the weekend worship experience for. But I can't isolate that out because I teach my church that our mission is to not only to reach lost people but to exist for the world, right? Our, our church exists so that we can accomplish the mission of Jesus in the earth. And I take a statement like that that everyone agrees on, and then I say our weekend worship experience is going to, in large part, and really primarily, have a hyper-focus for that purpose. And then people start bringing um, this, this, this paradigm to bear that, that now I'm not preaching the word. I'm not feeding the flock. You hear that? Oh, yeah, but you know what the thing is? I, 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 listen to, uh, I listen to Chandler preach every chance I get, and I hear a guy who's trying to teach his church that we should be about mission, we should be about others, we don't exist for ourselves as individuals or as a body, and we're not here to entertain you. And that's the same thing I'm saying to my church when I say we exist to reach people far from God, we exist to reach lost people. And so, for instance, right now I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians. I'm doing a walkthrough of Ephesians. And I'm tying it in with certain things from the Old Testament about the promised land, and I'm equating the spiritual promises, you know, Ephesians 1, 3, every yeah. spiritual blessing in Christ to the, the promised land that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. And so I'm preparing a sermon on eight verses from Ephesians this week, and I think you'd love it, and yeah. I think you'd think it's a great sermon. And I yeah, think but Chandler I think you just like started doing that because you're coming to this conference. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not... You know, people no, I'm don't, saying, I do that all the time. I'm saying, get up off me because I preach <laughs> Ephesians. And, and that, is, that is the misnomer, and it is a caricature. And to get up here and say, okay, Chandler represents building the attendees, Furtick represents building the attendants, of course you want to be on the side of that that's about building people. My whole life, my whole ministry about is about building people. I don't know about that. Of course I think you, you do. I, no, I, I think, I'm not sure that I would just be like, oh, well, I want to be about building people. Everyone agrees. I think what you're doing is amazing. I mean, you've had 10,000 people profess faith in Christ in your church in five years. I don't think there's nobody can touch that, all right? Yeah. The baptism is full every single week. You are reaching people far from God, and I don't think you should have to just sort of say, well, you know, I mean, you went. To, people don't know. You went to Southern Seminary. You can handle the Word. There's no question about yeah, yeah. that, but your contribution 
solution is people far from God. Right. And you're like, you're like fired up about that. People far from God. So you make it attendance and then you depersonalize it. Yeah. You just want to draw a crowd. And that's what a lot of guys who are very evangelistically passionate get pigeonholed into, is you just want your seats full. And so people say dumb stuff about, well, you know, if I wanted to draw a crowd, I start a fight in the Target parking lot and that'll draw a crowd so right. a crowd doesn't measure anything. Yeah. And so if you, if, you, if you make this thing about Chandler builds people, Furtick builds crowds, which one's better? We all are in this for people. Any of us with a good heart, everybody you've invited here today, we're in this for people. My, my contention is that without a hyper focus on reaching people far from God, staying on mission, our church turns into this feed me, bless me if you can club. And none of us want to pastor churches like that. Chandler is the strongest I've ever heard about rebuking that mindset in his own church. Right. So, you know, my time's up. All right, sweet. Okay. Um, what I've seen, and, and my, my fear with this evangelism first yeah. type of mindset is um, really, I, I'd go back to Jesus, and, and then I think we can go into some other places, but we've only got four minutes, so I, I don't know what we'll be able to do and all. Um, you, you, you've got Jesus in, in Matthew 13, parable of the sower, right? He, he throws out the seed. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And, and that some of that seed falls on good soil. And, but some of that seed falls on, on rocky soil mm -hmm. and, and it sprouts up. It receives it. It loves it. But then as soon as it's not convenient, it's gone. Yeah. And, and so my fear, I mean, I guess an illustration would be um, a baby breastfeeding is cute. A 20-year-old breastfeeding is disturbing. Right. Um, w one's legal and one's illegal, right? Right. right. And and so and, and and well, I guess that that never mind. I, that that was filter caught that. Thank God. Um, and and so in in the end, my fear of this evangelism first mindset is that you've got a 40-year-old man breastfeeding, play, playing in the kiddie pool, who knows nothing of the ocean, nothing of the depths, and and I've seen um, life just kick people in the soul. Uh, who haven't developed really the depth uh, of knowledge in regards to the character of God and who God is. Yeah. And, and so that my fear is when it's evangelism only, our, our goal here, our job here is evangelism only, is that um, you're in the end, if you're for people, you're not doing them a service, it's going to go bad. And that if you, you it, to, to further the caricature, it almost becomes, do you want to reach people or do you want to be doctrinal? Yeah, yeah. You know, right. which do you want to be? Like right. you have to choose one of those. Yeah. And so I, you're, in, you're in Ephesians. I mean, Ephesus is the church to look at. Ephesus yeah. is founded in Acts 20, booms. Nobody's seen anything like Ephesus, right? Um, a riot starts. It, Paul says after two years, no one in Asia had not heard the, the gospel. Mega and church, day one. Blew it up. Now, um, in, in that... Um, he comes back uh, after this riot because people who were making money off of um, sinful gain couldn't make money anymore. Um, he, he comes back and he tells the Ephesian elders, look, I'm, you're not going to see me again. I got to go die. Um, but just know this, fierce wolves are coming. Um, ferocious wolves are coming. And some of you are those wolves. Mm. And, and then if you go to the book of Ephesus, I mean, you're, you're preaching through Ephesians right now. Ephesians 1 through 3, who the, who the believer is in Christ. Uh, you know, Ephesians 3 through 6, the, the behavior of the believer in Christ. All right, very Pauline, you know, gospel first, then how that gospel flexes itself out. Then if you go to First and Second Timothy, so Timothy, who is now uh, the elder in Ephesus, is being told by Paul, guard your doctrine, watch your doctrine, doctrine preach the word of God faithfully. Um, Paul even says to the Ephesian elders, Elders, I, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. I am innocent of your blood in any way. But you're going to watch the. You're going to watch. Is that my time or a minute? Yeah, no, that's your. Okay, that's you, you're going to watch. Um, you, you're going to watch in the end. Um, Ephesus die in in Revelation chapter two. So you've got this constant clamoring on. Paul to Timothy, on Paul to the Ephesian elders, Paul to the church at Ephesus to grow deeper in their understanding of who God is, of how God operates, of these really kind of cosmic level ideas. And you know, Ephesians chapter one, I mean, it's, I mean, it's dense. Uh, it's extremely dense. And, right. and so in, in the end, that, that, that's, that, that's where some of my problem lies with this evangelism first, is it tends to isolate depth and view depth as the enemy of conversion. And it's simply not true. Mm. So you end up with, like I said, a 40-year-old, you know, breastfeeding and, and playing in the kiddie pool. And that's just sad. Yeah. 
So we have a couple of correction points here. Uh, we have, um, look, I don't want to be caricatured as a person who doesn't care about people. I care about all people, and, and just because we're, we're reaching lost people and reaching out to them, that's caring for people. We're doing that. And then you got on this side, look, substance matters. Uh, pe- maturity matters. Ephesians says maturity matters. All right, so, um, but you're just in Dallas there. Y'all... Uh, I've heard you teach. You're just filling people's heads with a lot of Bible knowledge, just Bible fat heads, just like, I know so much about God. And that knowledge puffs up. That's what I think you're doing. And I don't think you care about content at all. I think all you want to do is just reach the person far from God. And I don't think you really appreciate what he said at all. So, so I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, if you'd allow the caricature for a moment, because um, we can get to what we, we know in a minute, I'd like you just to speak to that, because I do believe that what you said, Stephen, was accurate. I do believe that people le- level that, and really, because I have the privilege of knowing you, I just think they don't get it at all. Yeah, so, I mean, he's baptizing people uh, left and right. We talked about it. He can defend night. himself. You defend yourself. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not defending him. I'm okay. about to. <laughs> <laughs> but... To say that by leading my church in a way that is missionally and evangelistically focused produces a 19-year-old on the uh, 19-year-old who hasn't grown up yet. There's a... Do you not want to say the word breast? I mean, I've already already opened that door, dude. I've said it like seven times. It's clean now. (laughs) There, There... Okay, okay, there's this, there's this verse in Philemon. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith sure. so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. If an evangelism first church was me standing up every week and only presenting how to be saved, how to come to Christ for 45 minutes, and there was no, there was no progressive teaching or there was no prayerful study of how are we going to communicate God's word, you know, I, I, I've planned out my sermons and, and I've done this now for the entire five years of the church with a 12 to 18 month out view that doesn't start with what would be cool and what would create buzz and what would create hype. I think very seriously about what to feed the church. However, when I'm presenting to our church why we exist and why we do this, if I don't constantly stand up there and say, this is not about us. This is not about simply collecting more knowledge. This isn't simply about looking in a mirror, going away, forgetting what we look like. Jesus said, you know, Matthew 7. Uh, uh, what does it say in Matthew 7? Oh, uh, everyone who comes to me and hears these yeah. words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, okay? So I'm trying to create a church that doesn't just hear the word. I'm trying to create a church that does the word. And in that focus on reaching people far from God, the content of everything that I preach is going to grow a believer. That's the whole purpose. But the greatest growth of a believer is when they get outside of themselves and they realize this isn't about me. The most spiritually mature churches are the ones where the people aren't coming in asking what 47 Bible studies do you have for me, but what can we give to the world? How can we offer ourselves as living sacrifices? That's the kind of culture I'm trying to create, a culture where people are so mature that it's not about them, a culture where it's so mature that they have grown and developed in their knowledge of God's mission, God's character, and the word. Got it. To the point, give me a thumbs up, Perry. <laughs> hey, nobody's saying amen. I can't get nothing out of you. You're supposed to be boys. You come up here in the Chicago. That ain't right. They don't help you out. I don't, you no boys need South. to wake up, man. Your turn's coming. Somebody thumbs up somebody. All right, your time's done. You're, you're on. Here. Okay. Jesus. Um, but Hallelujah. Here. <laughs> That's good, man. Um, but here would be my, like, but I guess, so you kind of blow up on the scene. And, and so I didn't know a lot about y'all. I'm here in Furtick. We talked on the phone years ago, right? You, I mean, you had just opened the door, like 6,000 people came that weekend. All right, out of nowhere, no mailers, no nothing, just Holy Spirit drew them in. And, and so we talked, and then we had one backstage kind of chit-chat at Catalyst. Yeah. And, and, then, um, and then all of a sudden, you're everywhere, man. I mean, Rick Warren's, you know, having you, you know, do the intro to his new book or whatever, having you at his house, you know. Um, <laughs> took his wife on a date. I mean, I've never been to Rick Warren's house. I haven't either. I haven't I've never either. Been, Mark, um, you, Mark, you've been to Rick Warren's sure. house? I've been to his office. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll That's I'll what I'm saying right there. Greg's probably been to his house. No, just to his office. So is this, is my time getting eaten away here? Yeah. So in the end, but so here's what I do, Stephen, and here's like here's legitimate concern. Um, so I'm I'm googling you, 
I, I just want to know what you're about. They're, the Reformed community is not a big fan, uh, to be straight with you. Not a big fan of, of you. Of anything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> they love Calvin. <laughs> so, um, so I'm, so I'm Wait, wait, Platt didn't And, uh, <laughs> so, so I come across this video of you, and, and granted, I, I know I, I don't want to be judged by things I've said 10 years ago or whatever, yeah. but, but of you rebuking your crowd for wanting depth, and, and your defense of that yeah. was that we've seen a thousand people saved here, so from your own mouth, and the pulpit drives the church. Yeah. I mean, people can say whatever they want, but right. the pulpit drives the church. Y you're in front of your congregation saying, you know, you guys want to talk about reform, you guys want to talk about this doctrine, yeah, yeah, this yeah. doctrine, this doctrine. Yeah. Well, I want you to know, we baptize a thousand people. You can go somewhere else for that and everybody cheers and I'm heartbroken going yeah. you just did it bro you you literally just said evangelism and doctrine yeah. are are exclusive yeah and yeah. and so that's the kind of thing for me that I look at that and I'm going oh Stephen you watch the whole sermon or the no that's what I'm saying I'll, and that's what I'm saying it's unfair because you you judge by sound bites right yeah, so see. that's what I saw well the whole sermon was online you should watch the whole thing it's pretty excellent uh, <laughs> Because in that context, you're in Dallas, I'm in Charlotte. Our cities are very similar. We have a lot of people Church on every corner. A form of godliness, deny the power, power thereof, of dead dry religion, Ezekiel 37, valley of dry bones. We're dealing with a lot of that. And so to be, and you know this very well, sometimes I have to be hyperbolic. And sure. I watched that clip too. And man, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was, I remember it was actually the third service of the day and the tone was off and I was very angry. However, I like it, angry. It does make me angry to think about how many people are cycling through my church <laughs> as one out of four churches that they attend. You know, they go to this one because they like the children's ministry, this one because sure. their friends go the there, this one because the worship's hot. Yeah. And so sometimes, yes, there is, a, there is a hyperbolic sense in which I will say, if all you want to do is go deeper, and what you mean by deeper is, Give me abstract theoretical truth that is so lofty and so disconnected that I don't have to do anything about it. Just confuse the heck out of me so that I won't have to go home and treat my wife any better or so that I won't have to step across the street and reach my neighbors. Yes, I'm going to exaggerate my point to say, get out of here if that's what you want. And that was the context yeah, of that totally. clip in the sermon, but you sure. don't see the rest of that in the five-minute clip. Also to that, let me say one more thing. There is... For me, um, uh, there's something I heard you say one time, I think maybe at Desiring God, and I was up, this was right before I called you, the last time that I called you, and you're so kind to listen to my feedback. Um, Rick's rebuked me several times. Well, I called him Once. because I was listening to this thing, and you were, you were talking about um, the nightmare that is Dallas, and you said, here's what I'm dealing with, and the crowd went nuts. This was total red meat for that particular crowd. So you go... Um, in Dallas, I've got pastors who say, I'm going to preach on debt for four weeks. Hey, worship guy, write me a song. And so the worship guy writes a song, Debt is Dumb. And then the pastor gets up and says, Debt is Dumb. And, then he, and, and, and the crowd's rolling, and it's hysterical. And at the end of it, you say, Why not better? And then you deliver some zinger line that just communicates the essence of the gospel in, in two sentences. And, and, and the crowd goes nuts. And of course your way is better. You know, I've never been in a creative meeting that had anything in common with what you described and what that does to guys who are trying to preach in practical ways and reach people far from God is it makes us look like we're sitting around with no brains and we're not. We're praying, we're seeking God, we're fasting. I led my church through the New Testament in 30 days, new through 30. We just uh, finished a, a fast to begin our, our sixth year of ministry. The, and, and we fasted for 11 days together and we seek God and we seek God deeply. And I just don't appreciate the kind of rhetoric that's easy to get a crowd fired up about any more than you would to me, for me to separate evangelism and doctrine when we're just sitting around in a creative room thinking of ridiculous stuff and nothing is taken into account, that we really do care right. about God's right. word and reaching people. Sure. All right, I'm going to jump both in. ways. It is. True? Gonna, or, I, or I think untrue. that was a good comeback. I, I, I want this to push both ways. And yeah. I think we've pushed really hard on the, the, the caricature. Your numbers only. It's all you care about. You don't care about your people. You're not trying to feed them and grow them. You just lost people. I think we've pushed hard on that. They've heard some good answers, like reasonable explanation and understanding. Thank you. And I hope you can grow in the thing that you're being challenged about. But I want to come over here now and say, yeah, yeah I still think, I, I still think, <laughs> yeah, I, 
I still think that the, um, I think you're probably the most effective Bible teacher in Dallas for sure and that I know of and, and, and almost anywhere. I think you're amazingly gifted at that. I think people are coming to your church because it's like the evangelical equivalent of wine tasting. I think that they like, oh, the way that Matt, the way that, the way that, the way that Matt brings the word, so there's funny. just nothing like that. There's just nothing like it. And yeah. I, think, I think you are probably seeing some people one to Christ, but I honestly wonder if some of it isn't you're just seeing people baptized who grew up in a church where they didn't em emphasize baptism, but they're probably already saved, and they're coming for fine, fine Bible teaching. And... Um, you know, where's that going? Because he, he's trying to say, if you're not missional, it, it's, he, he quoted, great, Philemon 5. You know, I pray that you be active in sharing your faith. You may have a full understanding of all that is yours in Christ. Without missional engagement. Philemon 6, actually. Philemon 6, is it? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to correct him one time thumbs before up. this thing was over. Yeah, yeah. Thumbs up on that. Yeah, yeah. But I don't preach the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Um, what do I know? So. Um, is that yeah, okay well, that I yeah. did that? You want that, right? Yeah, like that kind of. Oh yeah, okay. brothers. Good word, baby. Like brothers. brothers, like brothers. So, like that, brothers. so I want to hear you speak to that. Jerry. Well, I, I think there are there are a couple <laughs> of things. I, first of all, I, I I think we see quite a bit of of conversion among what what I, I don't know how we want to label it. Um, the, so I got to baptize my daughter last weekend. The the girl in that that was baptized in front of her was um, you know coming out of the homosexual background. Um, her church background with, was her being sexually abused by her deacon All right, father. exception so, is an exception. But, yeah, but I can go through got some stories of like those, that. Hundreds of those. So m just as many of those as I, I grew up in church and didn't hear the Bible. So um, I, I want to, as best I can, um, attack um, we're here for Matt. Um, and, and so I, no, I, we're, I'm, I'm on the, we're here for the Bible connoisseur. I like sure. the way you teach the Bible. If K Arthur was here, I'd go to her church. Yeah. I'm talking about well, that. But I think there's enough I, I think there's enough edge to me to to get the kind of staunch, reformed, button-down guy to be, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to have uh, something to drink. I'm going to say the word hell occasionally as an adjective. I'm going to, you know, and that they, they tend to look upon those things with great frustration. So you're trying to break down some of the legalism associated yeah, yeah. with Bible teaching. But look, by, by Chandler's own admission, all right, I heard you one time or early on when I first started getting introduced to your stuff, which I love. I'm not just throwing that out there. I love his stuff. Yeah. He is, everything I was doing in that thing, you know, feed me, bless me, man, push back the high chair and get involved and start, and start seeking God, not in a sense of what's in it for you, but in a sense of what you can give back to him and live your life in this way. You were talking about when you came to the church and you took out the old guy who looked like Ned Flanders and, you yeah. know, and you said, man, I need you to stay with me on this. And you said something, you said, I'm going to change this and I'm going to change that and you're not going to like it and you're not going to like the music. But when we saw and you described dozens of grown men being baptized, you said, I knew that and he knew that we're in this for the same thing. OK, so I'm saying that's what that's what that's what makes your heart beat, too, is is dozens of grown men being baptized and the girl you just started to describe being right. baptized. And, and so you are every bit to me as offensive to the people who just want doctrinal depth for the sake sure. of knowledge and for the sake of their, for the sake of their own. You understand, you, you hate that every bit as much as I do. And you might come at it from a different way in how you run those people off, but that's what you described. And so uh, anyway, you, th you think that's right? I it's do, same, I think we're getting deal. some, I think that what we're finding out is is that people wanna typecast, this is what you are, you're nothing else, you're only this. And I think that's why we have conversation. Sure. That's the, I, I wanna hear from uh, some of these guys. What do you got, Driscoll? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Furtick's background, you're a musician, worship leader, artist. So he's gonna play to his strengths. Matt isn't an artist. I mean, his shirt. No, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not offensive to me. He's an athlete. He's an he I've known Matt for years. Every shirt has a collar. He wears a <laughs> polo, and he looks like an extra from a 1950s sitcom. He just does, you know? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add that until a couple of years ago, Driscoll was wearing a choker. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Necklace, no, 18 a, inch neck. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I wear jeans, they're skinny jeans. Just not because they're skinny, because I'm not. That's, that's, just, that's just how it works. So, I mean, part of it is you played your strengths. So, part of it, too, is his church is only five years old. So, he's going to have a lot of young so converts. And, you know, if he ends up having brain cancer, that's going to affect the way he teaches the Bible. 
as his people age, he's going to have to hit certain issues. Right now, it's all weddings, not funerals. Right. I, I mean, you know, he's serving the people he's got, and he'll change as the church requires. All right, well, another one of you guys? Uh, I, without, I don't know either one of these guys that well we've just met, but as I listen to Stephen, it seems to me he probably has an evangelistic gift in his life, and no Matt may not, and that's not better or worse, it's just different. And sometimes I think when you're an evangelist, and that's my gift mix as well, you know, I need to swing more toward the discipline of Bible exposition. Illustrations come easily. Uh, you know, the, all the, you know, appealing to non-believers comes easily. I have to work at it. But sometimes a guy who has more of a teaching gift, and it doesn't necessarily have that evangelistic gift per se, uh, needs, as Paul said to Timothy, to do the work of an evangelist. So I think both swinging a certain way, because look, every church needs a constant flow of new believers in it, because if a church does not evangelize, it will fossilize. Well, here's, what, here's, what, here's a quote from Furtick. Yes, it's my responsibility to edify those who already know Christ through my preaching and to feed and disciple the flock. But I always tilt the playing field toward the guy or gal who is far from God. Eternity hangs in the balance for them. All right? And he also said, if you know Jesus, this church is not for you. We do one thing, preach Jesus, so that people far from God can know Jesus. So um, clearly an evangelistic gift at work here. And uh, any response uh, to that uh, as an emphasis or overemphasis? I mean, yeah, obviously I, a quote. I stand by it. There's over, there's over 700 churches in Charlotte, and God did not call me there to create a boutique that would serve the needs of the people who aren't being perfectly served, who only like 97% of what their current church has to offer. I came to Charlotte to see a city turned upside down, to see some lost people saved, to see the kingdom of God built and extended and expanded. And I'm going to always, in terms of context, tilt the field toward my kid's t-ball coach who just lost his daughter six months ago and doesn't know the Lord. I've been inviting him for five months. And you know what? I've trained my church to bring those people with them every single weekend. So when they step out and they risk everything to say to their neighbor, to say to their friend, to say to their family member, come to church with me, I'm going to put it in a way that that person has the opportunity to respond to the gospel. It's important to me. My content is going to be biblical. I have a mandate to be biblical, to preach the word, be instant in season and out. That's very important to me, and I don't always do it perfectly, but I always do it with all of my heart. But I'm going to, in my mind, when I'm preparing that sermon, I'm going to picture my kid's t-ball coach. I'm going to picture that guy not having a clue what I'm talking about, and I am going to start with an entry point that helps him understand what the gospel is. All right, David Platt's a Bible teacher, very gifted, uh, growing church. Uh, your thoughts on the tug of war between evangelism and uh, uh, biblical instruction in I Sunday? Obviously, we all, obviously all want the same thing. I think, though, if we're not careful, we can become too dependent in our evangelistic strategy on what happens on that Sunday morning to bring people to Christ. When I look at the, I think it's far more effective than bringing as many lost people as they can to hear me. I think it's far more effective for me to send out thousands of people every week who have the Holy Spirit of God in them, who have the ability to share the gospel with people that I'll never meet in contexts that I'll never go. Like that's where evangelism needs to be happening in the church, primarily. It doesn't need to be primarily dependent on me, I don't, I don't think. I think it needs to be on the people of God. That's how the gospel spread in the book of Acts, with the people. Everyone except the apostles were scattered in Judea and Samaria. And this is how the gospel went forward, not because of the apostles preaching. Yes, they were equipped, but it was everyone except the apostles who went out and started the church at Antioch, which became a, a base for mission of the world. It was, it was the people of God equipped with the word of God and the power of the spirit of God who were leading people to Christ. And so for the t-ball guy, I want the guy who is in my church, who's on the t-ball game, uh, on, on the, uh, his son is on the uh, same team, I want that guy to be equipped to do that with this guy right here, instead of me having to do that with this guy, this guy, and all the infinite number of scenarios. There's people that are rubbing shoulders from my church all throughout the community that I, I, I want them to be empowered and freed up and not, not to have to even just invite people to come hear me. I want them to be able to lead them to Christ there at work. Right. And lead them to Christ not and just do disciple making there. And I think if we're not careful, we can become too dependent on what happens and, and creating the environment or whatever it is that we're going to bring people to instead of empowering people to do this all across the context of the community. That, that's where the city really gets affected. Perry? Well, first of all, I think I'm sitting in the coldest place in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm right yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Holy shnikes. Anyway, um, I, I, I agree with you, but I, I don't think it's either or. I think it's a both and. Um, I, I think I want my people to go out and, and witness and share Christ. But at the end of the day, I've got some people. Man, if Jesus was standing right next to them in the flesh going, you can do this, they'd be like, I don't know, man. I don't think I can, I don't th- I don't think I can tell people about you. And so I think you create the environment and you raise up the people because the thing I know about Stephen and the thing I know about Matt is they're going to teach the Bible. You're going to te- we, we, that's what we do. We teach the Bible. And even if there's an evangelistic bent on what you're teaching, you're still teaching the Word of God. So if I'm sitting there and I'm listening, you teach the Word of God, if I come with my fork ready, you know what I'm saying, yeah. you're gonna, I'm going to get something. So if I come to your church 50 times a year and you give me 50 new principles and I take those 50 new principles and apply those principles, that's deep. I don't care. How, like My life can't change that much, but if I can take just half of what you're teaching every week and apply that to my life, even though you're trying to, you know, your, your emphasis is on reaching the person that doesn't know Christ, Man, I, I think as long as you're teaching the Word of God, no matter what your motives are, Paul said, who cares what the motives are? As long as Christ is preached, praise God. And so if you're trying to, I mean, if the biggest thing, Stephen, that anybody can ever accuse you of is you just want to reach lost people, <laughs> I, th- I think you're okay. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think you're fine. But Matt, Matt wants the same thing. Matt wants yeah. the same thing. I just think it's, it's not either or. I think it's let both me, let, me, let me tie something, though. I, I will. We're going to go to Q&As in just a second. So let's wrap it up. We're going to hear some well, questions well, people have for us. Platt, Platt says, okay, um, and he, he says rightly, we've got to train our people to be able to share the gospel without us. It's not all about us. At the same time, you say, well, the pulpit is, I don't know if you said the rudder of the church, but something to that. It, it should, drives it. It drives the church. Um, if I am not faithfully, week after week after week, speaking to people far from God, in the gathering that is the worship of Jesus, that is all about the gospel of Christ, how in the world is the guy who has a t-ball coach who doesn't know Christ going to be able to model something that I don't model? So then I say, it's not only the weekend, but if I'm not starting with the weekend to say, we are going to reach people far from God through the preaching of the gospel on the weekend, and it's primary, how will it be primary in someone else's life? The way I'm going to get them engaged. And how in the world do we think these lost people are showing up at our church? It's through our people rubbing shoulders, as you described, and, and living a life that, 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 that makes the person want to respond. Clear. We're going to go to the questions now. We'll start with you, Matt. Uh, let me just uh, give you this question was texted in. Uh, to both of you, uh, evaluate this statement. I'm primarily speaking to Christians when I preach. Matt? Uh, I would say that I am primarily speaking to Christians when I preach with a view that there are lost people there. Okay. Stephen? I would say that I am primarily speaking to Christians when I... Just do it. When I preach. No, no, if you don't agree with that, say, no, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking of lost people, Christians, listen in. If I preach for 45 minutes, I am going to describe in that 45 minutes the character of a Christian or the action that this, this is calling for, what God's trying to do in our lives. But I'm going to do it in a context that is primarily geared toward the person who is outside and trying to bring them inside. And I am going to give preference to them in the way I present my message. So, so it's the opposite in, it in how we prepare because I'm preparing, okay, this is what the Word of God says for the saints here are going to be the objections and issues that a lost man or woman has with this. Let me address these things while I I teach this. That's what I do. Okay, it sounded like you were saying, you kind of start with what are the objections and then go to. No, no, I got got this, I got this. Preaching to Christians with, uh, uh, in the back of my mind all the time is non-believers. And I'm gonna get the gospel in there. And preaching to lost people, but remembering that I love and care for the people that are in my church, I'm gonna have something to say to them too while I'm doing it. Those are two very different ways of doing it. That's not the same thing, all right? And we don't, we're not, and maybe we're not called to the same thing. I'm not even evaluating, and I'm just saying, I'm not gonna let us make that into the same thing. It isn't the same. I think you just very took different. The, no, you just took that and you you took that and and you put it under a heading that was too broad. What I said is, I'm preaching to lost people, and I care about the, my church too. I'm saying my church exists for the mission of God in the world. And I am going to equip them, Ephesians 4, for that ministry. And I'm going to empower them with the word of God. And so if I'm describing, in Christ you are more than a conqueror. In Christ you are, and I'm really going for it, and I'm sweating. I'm talking about the condition of a Christian. 
but I'm going to explain that in a way that someone who is outside knows how they can get in on some of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to constantly have them in my mind in my preparation. But I'm not preaching a sermon that a Christian can't relate to. I'm not talking for 40 minutes about how to become a Christian and then, oh yeah, by the way, if you're into okay. this, here's something you can try this week. Good. No way. All right, second, clarified for sure. Second <laughs> a question, should believers, we've heard a lot of talk uh, about churches who tell Christians, you know, we're going to teach you how to feed yourself and so on. Should believers grow themselves or is it the church's responsibility to help people grow? Matt? Um, I think it, it, it's a false dichotomy. I mean, it, the church has a responsibility and, and so do you. I, I, our role is to train you for the work of ministry, but you have to be um, in submission, wanting to learn, wanting to apply, wanting to engage. And, and that's where he gets the disjoint and I get the disjoint with our people where, be, because you know, people come to hear me preach, but people come to, I mean, Stephen's lights out, man. Right. Friggin' like Dane Cook with the Bible. Right. And, and so <laughs> it's, I mean, lights out, man. I mean, I have to friggin' crack up laughing. He's, one of the best dressers I've ever seen. I mean, yeah. it's lights out. But, um, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, people hear him and don't apply it. People hear me and don't yeah. apply it. So our job is to unpack truth, build systems of accountability, but ultimately so they've got to own it. They, they've right. got to own it and apply it um, or, or they're not going anywhere. It doesn't matter how creative or how strong or how doctrinal or how whatever we are. Yeah. You know, it's funny because my thinking on these subjects really... Um, I, I really feel like I'm both, both, both. And I think that if you're, if you're listening to this, you should be saying, I'm both. I want to be both. You're, you're arguing, I'm both, man. Don't make me one. I'm both. I hear you saying, look, pe lost people are coming to Christ in my church. It's both. That blesses me because we started our church, you know, over 20 years ago now. And I was both, both, both. My heart was, I can preach the word verse by verse and win lost people. I don't want to be forced into it's one or the other. I always have use irreligious language. I always try to connect with people in a practical way. I always have lost people in my mind. But Jesus was like, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He didn't say a lot of stuff three times, you know. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. That must be important, right? And, and so I want to feed the people in the church, but I don't feed them Christian meals, you know, tear off instant preparation Christian yes. meals that only Christians can understand. Oh, I feed them the word of God in a way that any person who is hungry, and I believe everyone's hungry. Sure. I believe that anyone can be fed by this. Yeah. And, for, and I put lots of on-ramps into it so that non-believers who are there can get it and get on. The gospel needs to be in every message. I'm for that. But I just hate this idea that feeding sheep is, is at the enemy of reaching people. I hate that. And I also hate the idea that um, you're, you're, you're all about lost people. You don't care about the people in your church. And I just, I think what you said about false dichotomy, as brothers, we should not allow ourselves to be, and we've all said things. I mean, I was quoting things you've said. We've all said things in the moment. You said hyperbole. You only listen to part of the message. I get that. But at the end of the day, we, there, this is not a negotiable point. It has to be about both. You have to you never let someone say that you're only about lost people, even though that's your gift, like Greg said, but never let someone back you into that corner and say you're all about it. And don't be like that. Recognize your own tendency to slip off into that and feed the sheep. In the same way, um, you, you don't need to hear this challenge from me, but I'm just saying as brothers, let's agree about this. You have to be growing your church. You, one of the things I believe, you talk about the purpose of God in the world and you're seminary trained. The purpose of God in the world is not soteriological. Okay, it's not. The purpose of God in the world is doxological. The ultimate purpose is the glory of God. More Christians in Charlotte bring more glory to God. Better Christians in Charlotte bring more glory to God. In a church, in a church with that, in a city with that many churches, how many crappy Christians are there? They're detracting from the glory of God every minute they lead their crappy lives. Okay, so. So challenging people to be more God-honoring in your sermon, like you said, challenging them about their life in Christ, challenging people to be more God-honoring and growing up your Christians is not a waste of time. And how many times do Bible teaching pastors hear this thing, you're wasting your time, people are going to hell, you're just feeding your sheep, all right? Look, look, growing better Christians is part of the mission. It's not just get them the fire insurance and go on to the next person, all right? I, I'll, I put the top 5,000 Christians in our church about any Christians, against any Christians on any continent. They will take the mountain, all right? Yeah. They are missionally connected for the glory of God. 
And the, 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 how do we bring glory to God? By reaching lost people. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the ultimate thing of the glory of God has got to be central in the life of the church. So we don't win lost people or build the church, but both of those are subsets of our ultimate mission, which is to show off and display how awesome God's great son is. Amen. All right? Yeah. Amen. Well, Hey. All right. <laughs> Come on, Perry. What up? I'm trying, man. Come on, it's, Perry. It's probably frozen. All right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I, I'm, I love that. I think we've hurt each other. Yeah. I think yeah. I so appreciate you and the way that you've clarified what your heart is and things. I, I totally know there's people coming to Christ in yeah. church, and I'm thrilled about it. And, and I just think, you know, let's get on the same page. This can never be compromised, but this is what God has given us to reach people far mm. from God. It's all in here. And you feed them so that they can do the word. Amen. Amen. You feed them so they can do the word. That's where I'm coming from. I'm not going to feed you just so you can get fat and say that was wonderful. You feed them so they can do the word. Do you look sure. at people when you see them? Because when you say that's feed them so they can get fat, that sounds like you see a, a, um, uh, a Christian, you see them as already healthy and I don't want to make them fat. And I hear that. But when I see, I think of Christians mainly as like really malnourished, starving, yeah. starving. In, our, in the church today, selfish shepherds, shallow services starving sheep yeah it's everywhere it's everywhere Self, selfish, selfish shepherds. shepherds they only yeah shallow <laughs> services starving Dang. sheep all right three s's bro yeah i alliterated that's that a book. that's a book man that's a book, that's a book. all that's right a book. all right that session that session is over i think we've we've hurt each other we've, we've we didn't we didn't fold it down did we we brought it we we hammered it out together and i hope that's helpful to people and uh Let's, let's all commit ourselves to that dual purpose, no false dichotomy, both matters. Lots of water in the baptistry, tons of people coming to Christ, feeding them the word of God, not so they'll grow fat, so they'll grow healthy and yeah. bring more glory to the Father who loved them and saved them, right? Sure. All right, that's it. Wrap.